Okay, I think we'll get started on the final panel of uh, the evening. Um, so this final panel of what's been a really great conference so far, pre-conference, is uh, the datafication of modernity's institutions. My name is Andrew Liadis, assistant professor in the Media Studies Department at Temple. Um, so our first speaker will be Natalie Helberger, professor of information law at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. Yeah, Welcome. thank you very much. Oh, uh, there was a... a mic? It's right there. very much and of course you've read the uh, short abstract uh, very attentively and will now notice that there's a different title <laughs> um, and I was honestly preparing the presentation and um, I, about the re changing relationship between the news media and, and audience and the role of technology in this and I think it's really worth uh, story telling but then I realized that the reason why I want to tell this story is because it um, leads up to an uh, issue that I'm very much concerned recently and now, uh, now recently about, and uh, seeing all this expertise in the room, I thought I cut through straight to it and bring it to your attention and maybe get some of your feedback, which also means this is work in progress. Um, but um, yeah, I think this is what this place is uh, for. So far, we heard a lot about platforms and algorithms and content moderation and public interest and how important it is to safeguard this, and I fully subscribe to that. But I think it's also good to realize that media use these technologies too. Media also use personalization strategies and algorithms and data. And I think maybe even more important than with platforms is if we ask, how do the media use these technologies? And do they use them in a way promoting One thing that strikes us was the lack of orientation and vision on what the extent of your use of these technologies actually is in the news process. So I think it's high time to think more seriously about um, algorithmic journalist ethics and professionalism dealing with the power that AI and data give the media sphere and our consumption policies. Uh, as I said, it's still work in progress. It's informed uh, by normative and empirical research including our personal project, which is, I think, well, also featured in IPA. And it's also informed by the work of first pioneers in this area, um, including, for example, um, Curators um, and, and others. So I would love to hear your opinions if we go into the next direction. Okay. Good. But first, um, Um, very, very old fashioned it's black and white, and you would say, well, it's so outdated, so why is she showing us this picture? Um, <coughs> part of why I'm showing you this picture is, is if you listen in closely on the debate we are having about algorithms and the effect on the public sphere, we actually do keep romanticizing this picture very much. Yeah? Everybody's sitting together because of television, there's a television. One platform for all, the feed, the public sphere, with the information that we later can all use at the water cooler. So to some extent, we um, criticize this very old fashioned picture, but to some extent, we still think this was a very good idea. Um, but this ideal of the public medium as a public sphere is actually not beyond criticism and maybe not even very much ideal. And it has been criticized quite a lot. Um, given, for example, once described the lack of responsiveness in the British media as one of the most critical models for media regulation, infringement complaints within that most discussion of journalistic ethics can then turn on how to engage the audience. This is a glaring omission for competition that proclaims public service as its highest goal. So the presenters back there in the television have probably no clue what the different interests are of the users of the 
shoving it, and even more important, doesn't want to. Because he considers it as his role to tell the audience what it should know. And um, it is important to realize this, because this traditional notion of the media telling the audience what it's worth knowing has very much informed and is still informing the broadcasting regulation, media regulation, but also the professional guidelines and ethics of the press we have today. Um, and also the way we interpret Article 10, which is arguably at the basis of all these regulatory activities. It's incumbent for the media to import the information and ideas that the public has the right to receive. Not the right to ask, but the right to receive. So, and then laws and ethical guidelines will make sure that the content that the media is deciding to share is safe and diverse and nice to the audience. Um, so that the audience behind the screen can consume whoever they are. As I said, there was um, some problems with this approach. And more and more with the approaching, uh, with the development of technology, choice for user sneak in. What you see there is a telemetry system. It's one of the first KTV systems where users can actually choose between three programs by inserting a coin in the coin box. And this was the predecessor to a much more modern development that probably never really picked up, KTV, where later on citizens could choose between 60, 90, 120 programs. There was a development that was very much welcomed by liberal authors, again, of the patronizing behavior of the media. And some students suggested that information on the map is all that is essential to bring this to realize freedom of expression. And there was even a plan to turn the BBC into a KTV program, uh, which never was there. Uh, comes the internet, even more choice, um, and to the extent that users got more choice and there was more interactivity, also our urge to regulate for the public interest um, diminished. So, uh, especially on the online en environment, more interactivity, more user empowerment was also accompanied by a strong trend to deregulation, and that can actually the market um, solve the problem. And then has been something interesting. Um, at a certain point, we had so much choice um, that users simply could not make these choices themselves. They needed guidance. And this is ENPI, Data Analytics, AI Algorithm Recommendation, which not only shaped the activity of some of the big platforms we are discussing today, but also the creation of the news media, dashboards, hanging newsrooms that inform the journalists and editors which articles, which headlines are playing well, how long people are watching them, when they stop watching, at which point they stop watching, but also what kind of content goes viral. And the growing number of studies and newsrooms um, observe how the work of journalists and editors is increasingly metrics driven and how data about the interest of the users and our gut feeling of what the audience ought to see <coughs> informs the selection of content. This data is then not only used to inform the work of journalists, but also give you exactly the views that should be used. And so we, I think you already mentioned it more for commercial, which is um, and probably also address news presentation already. And this is in full swing. So it's not only the European Union stand. Check your local newspaper probably working with presentation already, which can argue we still have some sort of consumer choice. At the FAT, for example, lets you choose between, I don't know, 300 different editors. I wonder if there's anybody on the planet who did that. Um, uh, but they also soon realize that people are not doing it. So actually, now the trend is more to move more to pre-selection where um, being able to online is observed, and based on that information, your offer will be personalized. We once talked to Update, um, which they told us that they let uh, people fill in their personal preferences and uh, collect a lot of information. And once they've done it, they quickly throw it away because they say it's uh, self reported information is useless. We rather observe what people do. So that's the new. Okay, so where is this leading us? Um, arguably, this le is leading us to 
new form of relationship between the audience and users, um, which is um, very responsive, or you can say hyper-responsive. Thanks to data analytics, tracking possibilities, cookies, and, 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 and AI, uh, the new thing that we get are far more precise measures to, to identify the audio preferences. Uh, so you don't have to throw in a coin in the coin box anymore. Modern technologies make it possible to uh, develop these very, very detailed profiles, um, as Joe already said. Apparently, not only I can read your mind, but you should also get to my voice. Um, this information then is continuously fed into the presentation of the content. There's an algorithm feedback loop, so the program is continuously adapted um, to hyper responsive threats. Interestingly enough, um, if you think about it, this new form of hyper-responsive media is very much moving again into the direction of the old broadcasting system, where um, it's actually the presenter telling you what you should be interested in. Only that back then it was an educated guess, now it's based on data. So similar to the traditional media, algorithmic media, we claim the power to determine what users see. Uh, but there are also some important differences. Um, because they have so much data about preferences and hearing impaired, how much they can use the data to steer in particular directions, um, arguably they have even more power to shape our intellectual diets and set our agendas. We also observe a shift in power in media from editors to those actually able to program algorithms um, and work with them. Um, We also see that public values such as diversity suddenly um, are hard to wake to be used in an algorithm. I think um, Sona, you already told us, for example, about the difficulty of, of uh, programming bias into an algorithm. So very abstract public values um, must suddenly be expressed in methods. And uh, I think if you want to hear more about this, please read Nick's new book to explain all how this is going to be done. We also see that users have maybe even less agency than in their days when they were gathering in front of the TV due to the sheer opacity and complexity of this process, which as we are found them in our focus groups, they do not understand at all. And there's an interesting new level of abstraction where um, it's not anymore the eyeball that counts for the um, agenda points. We're not eyeballs anymore. And as data points, we are probably as abstract and as obscure and as far removed for news media as we seen as eyeballs. So in many respects, we are back to a circle, a uh, situation where the media tell us what we should see. Um, and if you remember what I said about um, the interest, the, the importance in such a situation to safeguard public interest, um, you will see that the question of how to make sure that public interest and our interest to be informed enters into this process is more important than ever. And this is why we were asking ourselves in the first news project whether the existing safeguards are still adequate to protect public and user interest when we media use AI and algorithms. And I think in answering this question, it's very much important to not only look at the technology itself, but the technology as it's being used in newsrooms and as it's being affecting users to look at the broader societal technical context, which is what we try to do in the first news project where we do empirical research into user perceptions, but also newsrooms. Good. Um, and we ask users, what do you think about algorithmic recommendations? And guess what? They like them. Um, that was a representative survey um, using the Reuters uh, survey in, in more than 40 countries. And overall, people were rather attracted to algorithmic recommendations. And so in some countries, they even preferred the algorithmic recommendations to the editors. But there are, of course, also concerns about privacy and diversity. 
and there are some more kind of terms um, which we can't. So we organize uh, focus group to get deeper into what people think about concerns and recommendations, and some other concerns popped up. Some of them related to this data by abstraction of the audience, that this could relate to stereotyping, which you mentioned, um, that profiles could be wrong, but also the manipulation potential, privacy, filter bubbles. So audience was also concerned about bigger societal questions. We asked them then how could we actually solve that concern? Because remember, part of this project is to find out whether you knew, knew new mechanisms to protect um, public interest. And they had some uh, ideas. Trust and information were mentioned, giving users more agency, more in impact for on the algorithm, and giving users more choice were important elements of that. And I come back to that point later. We then went on to news organizations and asked them of, and did in depth interviews uh, in Europe actually and asked news organizations so how are you using AI and algorithms and how do you make sure that important journalistic values and, and public interest is safeguarded. And again, um, also news from so many opportunities of the algorithm, but as a proper lawyer, I talk not so much about the opportunities, but the risks. So I will talk about this now because that's actually really challenging. But it's maybe good to, um, to mention that actually for newsrooms, algorithms can offer a lot of opportunities to, um, to inform better and, and to play their democratic role. Uh, I think it's good to see both sides of technology. Um, and I'm just mentioning some of the ethical challenges because um, otherwise the chairman will cut me <laughs> dramatically off. One is um, this finding the right balance between paternalism, being responsive to the audience, and, and being hyper responsive. And if you look into the few existing literature on the ethical issues there, it's very divided. So something is actually a really good development because finally uh, journalism will free itself from the elitism of writing and go back to writing really something for that public interest. And Hinton even goes so far saying that it's an ethical responsibility for the media to use data to be able to better inform people. Um, and there are others that are completely not uh, agreeing with this point of view. In fact, well, this is going to lead us in devil's kitchen because what will happen is if the audience tells us what we should watch, will that be the end of journalism? Remind the old um, uh, teacher of the Fiji. So what, what will happen if it's the audience who determines what should come into the news and not us? Filter bubbles was an issue already mentioned. Um, if personalization is too acute, it could prevent us from discovering all this great, surprising, diverse content um, and, and learning more about the world and us. And there you see how important messages can become in the whole process. And actually, I would state that unintended filter bubbles are simply the result of bad design choices. We do not want the algorithm to result in filter bubbles that we don't want. Try to find better metrics. But again, this, uh, as we'll see, is a very different problem of a uh, co complex problem of how to develop the metrics. Another ethical issue the news media are grappling with is data and the incredible power that this data gives and, and the responsibility that comes with the power. Remember, knowledge is power. So one of our interviewees said, after I see what you're watching three hours of TV, what should we do with that information? Should we stop showing you more content? Can you out playing? Is that one of our responsibilities or not? Or you know, is our task to keep you glued to the screen? So in other words, is that what we are optimizing for? Then you see again metrics coming back. What are we optimizing our algorithms for? Which is a very central question in newsrooms, and unfortunately a question that at the moment few newsrooms really have a good answer to. Partly because there are many new roles in newsrooms that are from social media teams, engagement editors, engagement strategists, news app compilers, and so forth, and so forth. All of them with their own interpretations of what diversity is, 
what usefulness is, what accuracy is. Um, at the same time, the competition with chatbots is enormous. And although I work with AI, I need to distinguish media from traditional chatbots, there's still a competition for all my attention. And um, another important factor is that many of these initiatives are actually situated in the R&D department of Newsroom. Sometimes these R&D departments are not even in the same building as Newsroom. So you have to cross streets to get to the editors. So you can imagine how much interaction there is between those who could actually determine the result of the, the, pro, uh, of the, of the outlet and what's the flow of the message and those doing the outlet. So those are some of the complementary factors. So taking all this information in sight, we then ask, um, so what does that mean for professional ethical dealing with algorithms and AI in newsroom? How should newsroom negotiate that? And to what extent do existing journalism ethical guidelines give an answer to that question? And remember, I was already talking about Article 10 um, and that the media is obliged to observing Article 10 uh, considerations. Um, for the broadcasting media, we outright regulate them. We never get that test. Here is the responsibility of the test itself to regulate us to the court of regulation. So, what is in these journalistic codes? Of course, there are many, but some basic principles I think we can identify. One is that um, you have regulations on the organizational level, so uh, for the news medium itself, you find it a mission, having editorial checks and balances, and on the level of the individual journalist, fair reporting, accuracy, which is comprising, and so forth. And all of this is to benefit <coughs> the user and society in their right to freedom of expression. But if you look at these quotes, and uh, actually, Yas Campos and uh, Sedat Boy did that for uh, more than 90 quotes worldwide, and they found out that of these 90 quotes, only five quotes were actually updated to even include the word digital. So they're still very, very free digital and certainly do not talk about AI and algorithms. Also, in most of these quotes, there's a very strong production tie, not only the distribution tie, but the right arrival of personalized communication, personalized recommendations, which have to be distributed. Like, how do I get the content to the user? That is creating a lot of new legal ethical challenges. Um, obviously, there's a very strong focus on uh, human judgment and professional behavior. We're obviously talking here now suddenly about algorithms realizing a lot of these public values. And there's very strong focus on the traditional actors. And guess what? Normally, many of them um, audience engagement tools or algorithm developers. Yeah. So, what needs to change? Um, and this is our observation. A lot has to change. Um, first of all, individual uh, journalists. Remember, those are alpha. There's that journalists, right? And a lot of have studied literature or uh, language, and they're not exactly used to understanding tech, and so far also reluctant to talk about those two new technologies. So this has to change. I think we have to understand the potential technical possibilities and limits, and have to find this where balance, where to over rely or not on metrics and how not to abuse them. But the biggest changes are probably at the organizational level. Where it's up to the news organization that makes sure that the R&D department is talking to the editors to together develop new metrics. Because without vision on where this news outlet should be heading and how they should interpret this notion, there's no point of developing smart metrics. Another thing that has to change is that we have not only to take into account the interests of society, but interests of users. Because these um, Users are getting personalized recommendations. So actually, if you start drafting new codes, I think these matters like explainability, intellectual privacy, confidentiality, but also refrain from stereotyping manipulation should be considered. So a lot of has to change. Not just how we look, but then <laughs> that's uh, the next thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So our last uh, speaker for the evening will be Allison Hearn, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at Western University. I'm going to stay here because like you, I'm 
tired, <laughs> if that's okay. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read slash talk. Uh, in his 1942 essay, The Position of Political Science, Canadian political theorist C.B. McPherson asserts that scholarly work should serve progressive political practice, arguing that the political scientist will be a better scholar if he is also a protagonist. But McPherson goes on to argue the obverse as well. In the words of William Lease, he claims that the scholar could only serve the protagonist by being a good scholar by participating vociferously in academic debate and insisting on scholarly rigor and academic freedom within and beyond the walls of the university. A mere eight years later in 1950, another Canadian academic and colleague of McPherson's, economist Harold Adams Innes, gave a commencement address at the University of New Brunswick entitled A Plea for Time. In it, Innes describes the ways in which universities have been overtaken by budgetary obsessions and the fetish of technological innovation, critical thought replaced by the mere transmission of um, uh, information. He writes, the relative adaptability of various subjects to mechanical transmission has threatened to destroy the unity of the university. It tends to become a congeries of hardened, avid departments obsessed with an interest in funds in which the department which can best prove its superficiality or its usefulness is most successful. For Innes, as for McPherson, universities were intended to be places where, quote, the flower of vital energy that is thought, capital T, could be nurtured, free from external determinations and the blight of present-mindedness brought about by commercialism and technological fads and fashions. Quoting Albert Schweitzer, Innes concludes his address by stating that, oh sorry, my slides are weird, that the overorganization of our external development leads to the organization of our absence of thought. I raise these two important mid-century thinkers today not to romanticize their views of the university. After all, at the time, the university was pretty elitist, white, and male but to map how far we've traveled from the institutions of modernity named in the title of this panel, and to frame a very general discussion, more like a creed occur, actually, about the myriad ways in which datification and broader forces of surveillance capitalism have profoundly reshaped the parameters, conditions, kinds, and quality of our work as educators and scholars within universities today. To be sure, most of us in this room have embraced McPherson's invitation to be both scholars and political protagonists in and through our work. We decry forms of data power, violence, and discrimination, expose the exploitation of Amazon or Google workers, identify the threats to democracy posed by computational propaganda, and expose, and expose the exclusionary politics of classification that accompany the rise of new technologies. And yet, in my experience, the context within which we conduct much of that work, the very breeding grounds for new technologies and monopolies of knowledge, our universities, have tended to be the last places we turn our critical attention. And our own identities and practices as scholars, the tensions and ambiguities that arise from the ways we might ourselves profit from the exploitative logics of visibility definitive of social media platforms, for example, are rarely called out or assessed. And yet the fact remains that practices of datification and or governance by data via private tech platforms are remaking universities and education from the inside out, redefining the contours of what counts as effective teaching and ethical research, the ways our fields of study are, are organized and assessed, what it now means to even be a student and scholar more broadly, aligning these new definitions with the capitalist logics of platform capitalism and Silicon Valley triumphalism. The modern university envisaged by McPherson and Innes in the mid 20th century was based on the German model, of course, predicated on the necessary interconnections between teaching and research, useful and useless knowledge. 
As Bill Reddings describes, this vision was initially guided by the principle of reason and the negotiation between established tradition and rational inquiry in the Kantian mold, and then by the principle of culture, as advanced by Humboldt and Schiller, which tied the development of individual character and autonomy to the expansion and consolidation of a national public culture. As late as 1983, Jacques Derrida theorized the university in and through Kant's view of the conflict of the faculties, signaling the paradoxical nature of an institution that requires authorization from outside agents, government or industry, in order to be free of them, to reflect upon, criticize, or challenge them. These orienting or regulatory ideals for the modern university as a complex but necessarily autonomous institution that governs itself and encourages research unfettered by outside demands or interference are long gone, of course. The university has not been modern in these senses for many, many decades now. The present-minded commercial tendencies in Islamented in 1950 were explicitly embraced by 1963 in former University of California President Clark Kerr's now famous concept of the multiversity, an externally focused institution whose primary role was to produce human capital and actionable research for the burgeoning knowledge economy. This view, firmly in place by the 1970s, allowed government officials to starve universities of public funds while simultaneously demanding increased fiscal accountability from them, or what Paul Axelrod has termed more scholar for the dollar. Today, funding provided by the state at the University of Virginia or Michigan, for example, is a mere 10% or less. And in Canada, provincial investment in higher education accounts for well under 40% of the overall operating budgets of universities in a supposedly publicly funded system. In the UK, of course, we've seen a dramatic reduction of over one third of the state's block funding to their universities and the deregulation of tuition, where students are expected to pay the full cost of the teaching they will go on to consume. In what is now a familiar story, the reduction in direct state funding in the name of austerity has forced universities to find, quote unquote, opportunities to diversify their revenue streams. Again, I apologize for my slides, it's Mac over to another thing. Rising tuition, tech transfers, patents, and other forms of commercializable research, intensified alumni fundraising efforts to boost endowment income, the strategic use of student aid, the growing market in student debt, licensing and branding deals, decentralized responsibility-based budget models that encourage innovative fundraising and increased competition at the faculty level, the reduction of wages via the growing use of precarious contract faculty, intensified recruitment of high fee paying international students, and the development of branch plant campuses overseas. All of these revenue generating efforts have resulted in the wholesale rejigging of universities into the phenomenon that Slaughter and Rhodes have called academic capitalism, and others call the corporatized or neoliberalized university. More than this, and congruent with the dominance of finance capitalism, Dam Nemzer and Brian Whitener have illustrated the ways public universities in the US specifically have become sites for the circulation of overaccumulated capital. Trading students, construction contracts, research patents, endowments, and student debt with all the alacrity of a Wall Street brokerage firm. Today, I'd like to suggest that these characterizations of universities as corporations or even as sycophantic handmaidens to finance capitalism, while not incorrect, also feel quite quaint. Given the degree to which universities are increasingly automated, outsourced to private platforms, and datafied, they might be better characterized as prime targets for data colonization by big tech. Their ivory towers and graduating rituals mere vestiges of long forgotten modernist ideals. Under the pressure of austerity demand and demands to make learning more efficient, more objective, more responsive to the labor market, universities have slowly but surely subcontracted many of their operations to private tech companies over the past decade. Uh, from 2017, uh, as of 2017, research group EduVenture identified over 500 private ed tech ventures, vendors. 
from online program management systems to research metrics, from customer relationship management software to enterprise resource management, ed tech platforms promise that the data they extract, analyze, and deploy will provide solutions to what is purportedly ailing universities. And here's just a picture of all of the ed tech startups as of 2017. Analyst Margaret Mattis found that 84 out of the 115 US institutions she studied employ for-profit online program managers such as Pearson, Wiley, or Blackboard, not just to host online classes, but also to manage curriculum design, course delivery, student recruitment, counseling and retention, hiring, and university marketing. While there's much to say about the problematic transactional assumptions underlying customer or resource management platforms that track and rate employees' personal details, or performance management software like SciVal and Insight that track, rank, and compare faculty output, here and very, very briefly right now, I want to focus on forms of ed tech that deal explicitly with students and pedagogy. As sociologist Ben Williamson describes, since 2010, Silicon Valley has been heavily involved in incubating ed tech startups. Like everything else emerging from the tech sector, education is seen as something to be hacked. New apps and platforms such as Learnization, Quiz Prep, Brain Wars, and Study Tracker are promoted as fundamentally disruptive, revolutionary, and able to provide highly personalized learning experiences. The digitizing of education involves automating course content and its delivery via MOOCs and online platform managers, and includes the ability to modern, mod, monitor student involvement in real time and adjust content to students' skills in order to optimize them. Under these conditions, Williamson writes, e-learning software trace students' every digital move, calculate their educational progress, and even predict their probable outcomes making them the subjects of increasingly pervasive data mining and data analytics. And while education is reduced to content and students become sites for the extraction and mining of valuable data, professors inevitably become content deliverers, pressured to adapt or be replaced by automatic, automated processes such as teacher bots or cognitive tutors, which are computerized software agents that are designed to interact with learners conduct constant real-time analysis of their learning, and adapt along with them. As e-learning software is oriented toward individual students, the idea of a core collective curriculum or education as a collective experience where values such as argumentation, debate, and respect for difference are promulgated is evacuated. No inculcation of critical thinking skills required here. Within this digital imaginary, professors move from sage on the stage to guide on the side, helping each student learn with the aid of bots in their own class of one, where they can remain impervious to their social position, institutional setting, or broader political context. And profs can avoid any of those gnarly political questions about free speech or access to identity or rights or other myriad forms of work and community building involved in providing a critical education. Rather, and in keeping with the promotional logics endemic to social media platforms in general, professors are encouraged to become tech influencers in the classroom, expounding the virtues of one platform or piece of software over another, or better yet, social media personalities by creating their own Instagram page or YouTube channel to provide additional actionable information for students. Already, the successful adoption of tech in the classroom is being used as a measure of faculty competence. And no doubt, we will increasingly be asked to prefigure our course content in advance to make it more amenable to processes of datification and algorithmic parsing. In this sense, mostly privately owned technologies uh, are working to revolutionize the educational experience, must be understood as overt techniques of power, working to de-skill and outsource professional competence and expertise, alter the grounds in terms of speech, limit academic freedom and scholarship in covert ways, and colonize and redefine public universities with privatized just-in-time logics. 
It goes without saying that these initiatives have the full support of government and industry who are besotted with the hyped up promise of cleanly packaged, highly trained, optimized, and psychologically compliant human capital. As ed tech has advanced and been adopted on our campuses, questions abound, as they do in society at large, about privacy and data protection, of course. Critic and journalist Audrey Waters has enumerated the myriad data hacks that have occurred on campuses and within ed tech companies themselves. These include 77 million users' accounts stolen from Edmondo, $11.8 million scammed from McEwen University, privacy breach breaches at Stanford, malware attacks at the University of Alberta, and infinite numbers of phishing attacks that have resulted in 14 million college usernames and passwords for sale on the dark web. Margaret Mattis not only identifies the degrees to which US universities are outsourcing their core educational mission, mission to for-profit OPMs, she finds that most online platform managers boost their bottom lines by collecting student data. Figuring students as leads through their content delivery and recruitment work, these companies use the data that collected to enhance their marketing efforts for other clients. Mattis exposes the fact that universities generally turn a blind eye to these violations of privacy, leaving students vulnerable to predatory lenders and other kinds of bad actors. A recent data protection impact assessment report focusing on the use of Microsoft Office Suite by government workers in the Netherlands found that Microsoft systematically collects data about individual usage practices on a large scale, covertly, without informing people, and without offering any possibility to switch off the data collection or see what kinds of data are collected. When I asked the lead cybersecurity person at my university about our Microsoft license, he couldn't guarantee that Microsoft was not collecting content, functional, or diagnostic data, transporting that data into a US jurisdiction, or distributing it to its other services, suppliers, or subcontractors. All of this says nothing about the ways in which learning algorithms themselves are biased and reinforce already existing forms of social discrimination and division within and beyond higher ed or about the way state actors are using data to undermine collegial governance and university autonomy via external university ass assessment practices, or even the ways the use of various technologies such as facial rec recognition or AI challenge our own ethical practices as researchers. Given these few brief examples, it's not a reach to argue that just as the rise of various forms of computational propaganda have fundamentally altered the grounds and terms of democratic participation, the widespread embrace of private ed tech and the generation and unregulated deployment of student and faculty data similarly threaten the very unity, definition, and purpose of universities themselves and our work as students, scholars, and educators within them. Put simply, Big tech is increasingly coming to govern the core research and teaching missions of universities, while also subverting any potentially shared facts or understanding about one, what universities should do or be. The proliferation of ed tech works to acclimatize students to the insecure transactional and surveillance logics of the platformed gig economy itself by encoding these values in the very process of education. A recent forecast about the future of higher ed uh, emanating from the Silicon Valley-based Institute for the Future envisions the dissolution of universities entirely and their replacement by something called the ledger. Fueled by blockchain technology, every interaction, every gig, every book read, every online module, every micro project would be converted into edu blocks which would become the basis for new form as of micro-credentials and stored in the ledger. Employers could use algorithms to match workers with the specific set of skills required for each discrete gig, and each new gig would become a new edge block in turn. According to critic Alex Mean, quote, individuals can track which learning opportunities provide the highest income and search for companies to invest in their learning. Within the ledger, anyone can teach and anyone can learn at any time. By creating a complete accounting of our practices, skills, personal disposition, and reputation, the ledger transforms living into learning and learning into labor, conflating education, work, and currency. In this vision, the identities of professor and student disappear. We are all both 
all the time. Expertise is authorized in a dispersed and opaque computational process governed by private industry, but remains instrumentalized, prescriptive, and transitory. In this vision, the role of universities as authoritative credentialing agents is displaced by big tech companies once and for all. Here, we become perpetual projects and sites of speculative investment by others. Indeed, parts of this vision are already at play in the rise of income sharing agreements, or what are called human capital contracts, where private investors offer loans to students in a high return field, say computer science, and students pledge a percentage of their future income against the loan. ISA investors can pick and choose which students in which areas of studies are worth their investment, skimming the best and most profitable investments off the top, reinscribing already existing social stratifications in the process. As the student becomes a zone for financial speculation, student identity and childhood itself are redefined. As Malcolm Harris writes, quote, instead of just trying to build a resume that appeals to admissions committees, students would spend their adolescence trying to build profiles that scan as successful to investors. Every child becomes his or her own startup. Now a mall, a bank, an entertainment complex, a branded experience, a construction site, a tourist destination, a retail enterprise that peddles innovation, creativity, and information alongside its cool hats and hoodies, and now a full-blown data factory, are we witnessing the final fragmentation and dispersal of the modern university at the hands of big tech and surveillance capitalism? How can we act as scholars and political protagonists within and against the terms of the outsourced datafied academy? To whom are we responsible and for what reason? Should education be deplatformed? Should we reject the pressures and exhortations to self-promote online and compete for academic stardom? Should we unionize and work to protect the rights of our precarious colleagues? Should we continue to insist on our academic freedom and institutional autonomy? Derrida would remind us that there can be no responsibility without the test of aporia or undecidability. Clearly now is the time to test the limits of our own political and scholarly commitments in the face of these realities and fight without guarantees for a future where the pursuit of truth and reason through expansive, transformative, progressive, independent scholarship can still mean something. Thanks. OK, so I think we have a hard out at 4.45. That leaves us roughly 10. We've got 14 minutes, and then we have 15 minutes for wrap-up. OK. Sure, OK, 14 minutes for discussion. Thank you, Alison, for a fantastic uh, call to action. I've been thinking along similar lines for some time, but uh, <coughs> was able, uh, haven't been able to put it in such a, a powerful way as you just did. So thank you very much for that. My thinking is, okay, in, as a, a social scientist or you know, in the uh, humanities, okay, in the not so hardcore scientists, okay, disciplines, our, uh, 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 you know, uh, our impact is quite limited within the university because the university is, I, I think, on this continent as much as in Asia where I come from, is dominated by this engineer, okay, uh, like uh, uh, you know uh, another species. Right? But I, so I've, I've been thinking about uh, uh, actually uh, as a teacher. So I'm asking this as a teacher who teach uh, information policy, and uh, uh, almost every year I have a general education class where I would have a student, actually sometimes they come from computer science, science you know, com from engineering, but they're interested in policy and e equality issues. Is there, you know, maybe you know or other resources, I, I want to have a hands on more of a, how can, how can I help? You know, this is one course that may take out of four years of their undergrad, but then, you know, they'll, they'll, they have much higher chance to be hired by Google or Facebook than my students in media and communication studies. So is there, do you know any of such a, a module, okay, or a, a sampler, like a 
syllabi that I can learn from and uh, you know and localize you know in in the context of where I'm from. Yeah. Do you mean about how to be responsible? <laughs> a crude word like uh, uh, in a few years once they're hired in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley or in Shenzhen they will be able to have their mutinies right I, I, I mean I think I, do, I don't have an answer I mean there are a lot of great people in doing critical pedagogy and we were just actually talking I'm talking with Katya at lunch about uh, working with engineers and and um, and also Solon was there too, and Joe, uh, how, how to communicate to them the sort of stakes of what they're doing and to try to get them to understand that what, what they're doing is taking place within a sort of set of interested contexts, like social contexts, political contexts. Uh, I don't think it's a hard uh, argument to make. I don't know others in the room might think that it is hard. Maybe you've had a hard, uh, a difficult, or, you know, it, because they are just sort of, it is instrumentalized in their departments. But I think the state of the world is such now, especially with climate change, um, that it's kind of all hands on deck, really. So I don't know. I, I can We can talk more about uh, uh, materials, pedagogical materials I can point you in the direction of. But I don't know. Other people might have answers, like how to raise consciousness <laughs> uh, amongst people not in our, in our fields. It's a challenge. So already happening with the reduction, right? So for the students, what do you I don't have an answer to that very difficult question. So I hope that wasn't why uh, you are indicating I should go next. Although I will say that Casey Fiesler has put together a collection of all kinds of different tech ethics syllabi. Casey Fiesler at University of Colorado has a collection of tech ethics syllabi. That might be a good starting point. Um, my question was for Natalie. Um, I was wondering, I think you use the term, you know, media uh, uh, sort of as like a, a broad umbrella term in your presentation. And I'm wondering if you've in the course of your research or your thinking thought about different aspects of the media, either along particular uh, um, types of like publications or uh, medium or even like among the differences between sort of freelancers and like staff journalists. Like, you know, it seems to me that media actually, just like everything else, encompasses a lot. Um, and so how that affects your sort of take on the questions of like algorithm, uh, algorithms and data. Yes, thank, thank you. It's an excellent question. Um, also because I think the way we, the media use AI and algorithms and, and what they optimize for, do I optimize for clicks or do I optimize for presenting people with more diverse information, um, very much depends on, on the outlet and the business model of the outlet. And, um, and you... Um, uh, yes, you caught me. I, I was very much talking about the yeah, quality media and, and to some extent even the public service media, although um, they also tend to optimize for clicks only at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think there is much more differentiation to, to, to make. Uh, very much agree. I think from the legal point of view, we have a complicating factor that... Um, we do regulate broadcasting because it was considered to be so intrusive and especially because this the TV tells you what to think kind of dynamic where we um, refrained probably also for historical reasons always from regulating the press which makes it even more complicated so um, but it's a good point that um, that actually we should consider when when developing this framework further that there are also I think different levels of, of responsibility so thanks for pointing me to that 
this is for um, Alison, just your reflections. In addition to looking at it in terms of how um, tech platforms are influencing through simply taking ownership of infrastructure within the university, I was curious about also a key a challenge that we're faced now as a uh, unique, in many ways, the first time we're faced with this within this space as um, social scientists and humanities scholars is also the direct impact of uh, funding of research by uh, Silicon Valley and the tech industry and the tech sector. And I'm curious uh, to try and shape our understanding of uh, societal implications of you know, data and, and datafication. And I wondered if you had thoughts on how to respond to that. Thanks for that. Oh, this is such a difficult question. Um, because, you know, there's a long history of the sort of, uh, like, educational, industrial, military complex. This is not a, a new thing, the co-imbrication. And I mean, it, I mentioned Clark Kerr for a reason. Uh, for those of you who know him, he was the president at UC Berkeley during the free speech movement in, in the early 60s. And the first version of this paper I gave actually was for a political um, conference or a, an academic labor conference in Canada where I was trying to talk about threats. That, and the theme of that conference was free speech and academic freedom. And I was trying to think about, okay, what are, and this is sort of actually something that Anna raised in her talk about trying to understand the grounds and conditions of speech. So we have all these debates about free speech, but we're never thinking about you know, what are, what are the sort of structural, political, economic, material constraints that enable speech for some and silence others? And there are huge debates about academic freedom. Is it an absolute value? Absolutely not. But it's also been teased apart from issues of diversity and equity, and they should be married, in my opinion. But in any case, um, I've had debates, and I know there are people in this room who work at Microsoft, gone to Microsoft, I think that there is a way in which that can be very productive. But I really believe in independent scholarship. I think it absolutely must exist. And we need to figure out, like universities were the places where that independence were, was protected. They're never perfect. They're always paradoxical, as Derrida points out. And that goes all the way back, back to Kant. But that, um, that really what we need to do is be thinking about what are the constraints. Uh, government funding is another huge thing. I mean, I, I myself have a really hard time with that. And I don't know, uh, I don't want to dismiss people who have inside tracks. But I know that the scholars, the great scholars I know at Microsoft Research and other places are able to access things that I would never be able to find or even get close to. I can't get in the doors, say, of Ubisoft if I wanted to do some work on gaming. They, they, won't, they won't let me. Joe will probably have a lot to say about this in terms of sort of access, scholarly access to the work of, of the um, big tech companies. Can I just follow up in line? Because I think it's a really important question that I don't think we deal with very much. Back in the 60s and 70s, when CBS and ABC and NBC were the dominant, as people pointed out, media companies, they had social media uh, appendages, and they would uh, fund academics. And at the time, there was some really important writing by academics critiquing and investigating that. Rick Rowland wrote a whole book about it and, and the, the problems of, of that kind of research. I don't see anything like that going on here. And I think, as you pointed out, it, it may be just terrific stuff coming out of a lot of these places, people getting contracts in my own factory from Facebook and all of that. But, but there's no systematic attempt to interrogate the overall environment that that causes or doesn't. I, I'm, I'm open to either way. But we just, nobody's looking at it the way people were critically looking at NBC, CBS, and ABC. Thanks, guys. Uh, I also had a question for Allison. We were awesomely provocative talk. Um, if I may, I would also take the liberty to respond to the what is to be done question with, as an inveterate unionist. Uh, with um, one, a lot of us are in this room, if you're in media policy, you have something of an activist background. And while we're often very good at explaining like what is wrong to our students, you also probably have experience like talking to strangers and knocking on doors. 
many of our students don't know how to do that. And if you can like explain to them like how to talk to strangers and have an organizing activity, like that can be built into classes all the time. I did it three weeks ago. It happens easy. I was like, if you get assigned, for example, a contract to build a targeted killing system that, you know, could be named Maven or something, what would you say to your <laughs> boss and how would you do that? Like these are conversations that we can have. Um, and I would also say that um, much like Allison's um, presentation showed, like get in where you fit in. Like there are lots of things to study at the university that can be are really provocative to students because it's exactly like what they see and experience every day. That includes like university budgets. And I would push back on the fact that like universities are, um, or humanities and social science scholarship is uh, not at the center of the university. It may not be in the center of the discourse, but like our low cost classes subsidize the expensive and non uh, unprofitable work that goes on in the sciences and athletics and all that jazz that only exists because I only need a chalkboard to teach my classes, not a chemistry lab or something like that. Teaching that stuff to students really gets them into that. Um, to, to Allison, I would ask um, how the kind of legacy pieces of the university that still function as like a legitimation marker and make all this other stuff valuable because it has like the imprimatur of modernity, how that interacts with all these weird startups. Like the thing that kept coming to mind as you were talking was like, will any of this fly with an accreditor? Like I don't know if like middle states accreditation would be down with an edu block. Like this is the problem that a lot of like the for-profit schools have and why so many of them fail constantly. So, so how do these like new stuff, how does that interact with the old bureaucracy? Is basically my question. And I apologize for the rant, thank you. That's a great question. I, I mean, I think accreditation changes so much depending on uh, just not national context, but I know in, in Canada and provincial contexts, uh, accreditation is different. In Ontario, we have a very right-wing government right now who's now going to tie government or university funding to these performance metrics that they themselves have derived. And they've identified an agency, which they basically was made up about 10 years ago, to, to somehow assess. But there's absolutely total opacity around that. And I think that it depends on, and again, I want to make... Clear in my talk was very North American centric. I know that the situation is very different in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the UK, so I want to be clear about that. But assessment practices, state led assessment practices themselves, have been datafied. Uh, so, and as I was saying at lunch as well, the, the big the cybersecurity guy, Colin Couchman, who I talked to at my own university, is a really great guy. His observation was really true. It really rings true for me. It's like people are just like data drunk. They can't think straight. They let the data lead. There is no vision. Uh, and there's no context for that vision, at least in higher ed, in his experience. So um, that, and I think with assessors, in, especially in, at the provincial level or maybe at the state level, given what we know of some, some ways government works, maybe the same way. So we have, but I don't know. We have one last, I guess, quick question from Noah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'll try to make it fast. Um, I know it's getting late. Um, it was about this income share agreement. I recently heard about this for the first time uh, that it's uh, emerging. And uh, it was really funny to me as I've come from Scandinavia where, where it's text-based because it's, <laughs> it sounds a lot like tax, right? <laughs> You don't take it as a loan, but you uh, you pay back if you make money afterwards to these investors. It's just not the state. But then it, it was these super fiscal conservative people advocating it here in the U.S. Right? That it's great. Uh, Mitch, uh, what's his name? Mitch Daniel said at uh, Purdue. And uh, do you see it as a momentum for for then just taking it the logical next step and say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it as a text, or do you see it as a step in the wrong direction? Yeah, I'm, I mean, the, the, this example, the, that version of, um, of it, 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 Morgan Addison wrote about it about 10 years ago. They're, I mean, they're called human capital contracts. That's the original title of them. <laughs> so you sign a contract, and you're indebting yourself. Uh, you have to pay back the loan. But now it's become more, um, let's say, um, 
specified. So it's basically invest. It's like the guy who bought off the student loan of everybody just recently at um, was it Morehouse? It's the same logic. It's like uh, it's beneficent, right? It's like just individuals being beneficent to other individuals, but it does not solve the structural issues. So no, I see it as regressive. Okay, so thanks everybody for this. Thank you, Andrew.